Anthony Brooks, a 20-year-old Englishman who had grown up in French-speaking Switzerland and had been studying in France when the war began, was in 1944 an SOE agent in southern France near Toulouse. He had been receiving airdrops of explosives, which he distributed to his resistance people, who hid them in cesspools or even on locomotives when the drivers were resistance. We would hide the explosives on an electric locomotive, he recalled, and no German soldier is going to open up a thing that says 16,000 volts on it and it has got a key. Some went into lavatory water tanks. They would hold up to 20 kilos of explosive. Like most SOE agents, Brooks found that his recruits were impatient, eager for action, so we had to let them blow up trains every now and again, even if it was too soon and we had no orders. Every now and again we derailed the wrong one, and we had some bad press, you might say, and one train we derailed was a Swiss Red Cross train, and there were four enormous vans full of eggs, and people were trying to scoop the yolks out of the river to make omelettes and cursing us all the while. In April 1944, the 2nd SS Panzer Division, the Das Reich, moved into a town near Toulouse named Montauban. It was refitting after hard service on the Eastern Front, receiving brand new tanks, Tigers, the biggest and best Germany could produce. The tanks were gas guzzlers. Tigers weighed 63 tonnes and got one half mile to the gallon. They were subject to mechanical problems. They had only steel tracks, which wore out quickly on highway travel. Therefore, the Germans always moved the Tigers for any distance on railroad cars. The Tigers were concentrated in Montauban and kept under heavy guard. The railway cars they rode on were hidden in village railway sidings round Montauban, each concealed by a couple of worn-out French trucks dumped on top. These transporter cars were unguarded. Brooks put his sub-agents to work. One of them was a beautiful young 16-year-old girl named Tetty, who was the daughter of the local boss who ran a garage, and she had long ringlets, and her mother was always smacking her and telling her not to play with them. All through May, Tetty and her boyfriend, her 14-year-old sister, and others sallied out after dark by bicycle to the cars, where they siphoned off all the axle oil, replacing it with an abrasive powder parachuted in by SOE. Brooks told Tetty and the others to throw away the oil, but of course the French said it was ludicrous to throw away this beautiful green oil, so they salvaged it as it was real high-quality motor oil that fetched a fine price on the black market. On D-Day, the Das Reich got orders to move out for Normandy, the Germans loaded their Tigers onto the railway cars. Every car seized up before they reached Montauban. The damage was so extensive to the car's axles that they could not be repaired. It was a week before the division found alternative cars in Perigueux, a hundred kilometres away. Bad luck for the tank's tracks and fuel supply. The resistance harassed the division from Montauban to Perigueux. As a consequence, the Das Reich, expected by Rommel in Normandy by D plus three or four, actually arrived on D plus 17. Furthermore, as Brooks notes with a certain satisfaction, no train went north of Montauban after the night of the 5th of June until it went out flying the French flag or the Union Jack. The contributions of the paratroops on the night before D-Day and of the bombers and the resistance in the weeks before D-Day cannot be appraised with precision. But it is clear that while Eisenhower never had to worry about his rear, Rommel always did. According to General Eisenhower, before the battle is joined, plans are everything. As Supreme Commander, he directed a planning operation that seemed infinite in scope, was complex almost beyond description, and on which the outcome of the war depended. He insisted on, and got an all-out effort from staff officers at Chafe, down through 21st Army Group, Montgomery's headquarters, British 2nd and American 1st Armies, the Corps, divisions, battalions and companies, and all levels of staff at the various Air Force, Navy and Coast Guard commands. As a result, Overlord was the most thoroughly planned amphibious operation in history. When Eisenhower visited Bradley's headquarters, he told the officers, this operation is not being planned with any alternatives. This operation is planned as a victory, and that's the way it's going to be. We're going down there, and we're throwing everything we have into it, and we're going to make it a success. In a 1964 interview with Walter Cronkite, Eisenhower repeated those words. He spoke with intensity, frowning a bit, giving some reminder of the power of his voice, body posture, attitude and aura of certainty and command that he had displayed in 1944. 
Then he visibly relaxed, let that shy grin creep up the corner of his mouth, and added, But there's nothing certain in war. Unless you can put a battalion against a squad, nothing is certain. The job of the planners was to make certain of as much as possible. To do that, they needed to be in constant touch with troops in the field, monitoring the results of exercises and training manoeuvres to decide what would work, what might work, and what wouldn't work. They had to put all that information together with the input from the other services to come up with a comprehensive plan that everyone agreed to. The process started at the top and worked down. Eisenhower decided where and when. To deal with the objection that adding the Cotentin, Utah Beach, would be too costly because of the flooded areas behind the beach, Eisenhower's chief of staff, General Smith, suggested using airborne divisions to seize the causeways leading inland over the flooded areas. There was intense opposition from the airborne commanders, but Eisenhower ruled for Smith. By late January, Eisenhower's basic decisions were in place. On February 25th, Bradley's headquarters had an outline plan drawn up. British Second Army had one completed a month later. The process moved down to corps, division, regiment, battalion levels. General Freddy de Guingand, Montgomery's chief of staff, recalled that right along the chain of command, nothing was ever proposed that didn't meet with heated opposition. If corps wanted it, division didn't. If the army proposed something and the navy agreed, the Air Force was sure to object. De Guingand reported that it was Monty's 21st Army Group staff that made the decision to send the DD tanks, the swimming tanks, in on the first wave, with naval guns firing over their heads. Our reasons for using DD tanks in the van were to achieve an element of surprise which might be effective in demoralising the enemy. Also, they would provide rallying points for the infantry. At the higher levels, the temptation to reach down to solve lower echelons problems was great, but it was overcome. General de Guingand explained, At first we all tried to discover a school solution to the composition of the assault waves. Guns, engineers, tanks, infantry, in what order, where, etc. But after the first training rehearsal we decided the notion of a single formula was nonsense, and we let the particular assault section solve its own problem. Its own problem depended on the nature of the defensive works facing the particular corps, division, regiment, battalion. Each had a different problem, depending on the shape of the beach it would assault, and even more on Rommel's defensive works. But Rommel could not plan, only prepare. Planning made possible a concentration of energy and force, but it required a knowledge of where and when that Rommel did not have. Preparation for an attack anywhere required a dispersal of energy and force. On every beach that was remotely suitable for an amphibious landing, Rommel built defences. Offshore, the Germans' first line of defence consisted of mines anchored in the channel. Not enough to satisfy Rommel, but enough to cause a major problem for the Allied navies. Onshore, the defences differed to suit local terrain conditions, but the beach obstacles on the tidal flat between the high and low water marks were similar on Omaha, Utah and the British beaches. The tidal flat obstacles began with so-called Belgian gates, which were gate-like structures built of iron frames ten feet high. These sat in belts running parallel to the coastline, about 150 metres out from the high water line. Teller mines, anti-tank mines carrying 12 pounds of TNT, were attached to the structures, or old French artillery shells, brought in from the Maginot line, pointed out to sea and primed to fire. Admiral Rouge had no faith in landmines and artillery shells stuck underwater, as they had no waterproofing, but the marine mines he preferred were not available in sufficient quantity. Next, at about 100 metres out from the high water mark, a band of heavy logs were driven into the water at an angle pointed seaward, with teller mines lashed to the tips of some of the logs. At about 70 metres from shore, the main belt of obstacles featured hedgehogs, three or four steel rails cut in two-metre lengths and welded together at their centres that could rip out the bottom of any landing craft. Rommel bestrode France like a colossus. He could, and did, flood the countryside by damming rivers or letting in the sea. He could and did uproot and evacuate French civilians, tear down vacation homes and buildings to give his artillery a better field of fire, cut down forests to get the trees he needed for his beach obstacles. The obstacles forced the Allies to choose between risking their landing craft on a full tide 
or coming in on a rising tide, and thus giving the German soldiers an opportunity to cut down the first waves of attackers as they struggled through the tidal flat and up to the first feature of the beach, which at Omaha was a bank of shingle, small smooth rocks, or a line of sand dunes at Utah that could provide some cover. To make full use of the killing zone, Rommel had his static divisions, many of whose battalions were Ost units. In some divisions, the men were 50% Polish or Russian, right up close. At each of the beach exits at Omaha, for example, riflemen and machine gunners were in fire trenches on the lower part of the bluff, halfway up the bluff and at the top. Scattered along the slopes of the draws and on the plateau above were hundreds of towbrooks, circular concrete-lined holes big enough for a mortar team, a machine gun or even the turret of a tank. The towbrooks were connected by underground tunnels. Beside and around them, the Germans had fixed fortifications of reinforced concrete looking straight down onto the beach. In them, as in the towbrooks, there were panoramic sketches of the ground features in front of them, giving range and deflection for specific targets. In other words, they were zeroed in. Back down on Omaha Beach proper, the Germans had 12 strong points built to provide enfilade fire the length of the beach. Big guns, 88 Amiamim and even 105 Menamit, were put into casemates with embrasures that opened down the beach, not out to sea. The casemates had an extra wing on the seaward side to hide the muzzle blast from the Allied navies. Up on the bluff, there were eight concrete casemates and four open field positions for 75 Menamit to 88 Amiamib guns, all sighted for both grazing and plunging fire one very yard of beach. The guns came from all over the Nazi Empire, French 75S, big Russian guns, 105S from Czechoslovakia, others from Poland. The big casemates could take any shell the Allied navies could throw against them and still protect the guns. To protect the casemates from the real threat, an infantry assault with grenades and flamethrowers, the Germans surrounded them with landmines and barbed wire. So the GI hitting the beach in the first wave at Omaha would have to get through the minefields in the channel without his LST blowing up, then get from ship to shore in a Higgins boat taking fire from inland batteries, then work his way through an obstacle-studded tidal flat of some 150 metres crisscrossed by machine gun and rifle fire, with big shells whistling by and mortars exploding all around to find his first protection behind the shingle. There he would be caught in a triple crossfire, machine guns and heavy artillery from the sides, small arms from the front, mortars coming down from above. If the GI was not killed getting off his landing craft or crossing the tidal flat, if by some miracle he made it to the shingle, Rommel wanted him wounded before he got there, if not wounded, paralysed by fear. To keep the GI huddled there, Rommel had more mines laid. Between the shingle and the bluffs there was a shelf of beach flat, in some places marshy. Rommel loaded in the barbed wire but relied mainly on mines. They were irregularly placed throughout the shelf and of all types. Some were simple charges of TNT covered by rock and set off by trip wires. S mines were devices of the devil. They jumped up when activated, then exploded at waist height. There were others. Altogether, Rommel laid 6.5 million mines and wanted many millions more. His goal was 11 million anti-personnel mines. Behind the mines and astride the drawers, there were anti-tank ditches, two metres or so deep, and cement anti-tank or anti-truck barriers across the exit roads. All this was backed up by big guns at Pointe du Hoc, where there was to be a six-gun battery of 155S capable of firing into the mass of shipping off both Omaha and Utah beaches, another at saint Marcouf looking right down on Utah, another at long sur mer covering gold, and so on. Behind Omaha, once one got inland from the plateau, there were no fixed defences of any kind. Mainly this reflected the impossibility of Rommel's building a genuine Atlantic wall that had depth to it. The length was too great, the resources insufficient. Partly it reflected Rommel's all-or-nothing attitude about the battle for the beaches. But as every GI who fought in Normandy can testify, in the country of hedgerows and stone-walled villages, farmhouses, barns and outbuildings, fixed fortifications were not needed. The hedgerow country of Normandy was ideal for fighting a defensive struggle with the weapons of the mid-20th century. At gold, juno and sword, the beach obstacles were extensive, but the dunes were not so high as at Utah, 
and instead of bluffs behind the seawall there were French vacation homes. Some of these were torn down to give a better field of fire. Some were used as strong points. There were casemates, large and small, scattered along the coast. As elsewhere, there was no depth to the defence. At Utah, the beach obstacles were in place, but there was no bluff behind the beach, only sand dunes behind the one. To three-foot seawall, so the extensive trench system manned by infantry was absent, but the Germans had dug into the dunes a series of towbrooks with tank turrets mounted on them, connected by underground trenches, along with casemates holding heavy artillery, thousands of miles of barbed wire, and thousands of mines. The strong point at Utah was a blockhouse at La Madeleine. It had an 88mm cannon, two 50mm anti-tank guns, two 75mm cannon, a 16-inch howitzer, five grenade-launching mortars, two flamethrowers, three heavy machine guns, one under an armoured turret, and eight Goliaths. These were miniature tanks hardly bigger than a child's wagon, but they were stuffed with explosives and had a radio guidance mechanism. Behind the dunes at Utah, a road ran parallel to the beach. Four exit roads, or causeways as the Americans called them, ran inland perpendicular to the beach. The causeways crossed the flooded fields created by damming up local rivers. Behind the flooded fields, Rommel had troops stationed in every village, along with field artillery pre-sighted on the causeways. The troops came from the 709th and 716th Divisions, consisting of the Georgian Battalion and 642nd Ost Battalion. They had almost no organic motor transport. These inland units were used to build defences locally, consisting of sticking logs into the ground in any open field suitable for a glider landing. The Allies had used gliders extensively, if not very successfully, in Sicily in July 1943, and Rommel assumed they would again. To prevent it, he devised Rommel's asparagus, ten-foot logs driven into the ground, to be topped with shells attached by interconnecting wires. The shells didn't arrive from Paris until after D-Day, but the logs by themselves were enough to bust up a wooden glider going better than 100 kilometres per hour. For deception purposes, Rommel built casemates that held no guns. Admiral Rouge recalled, dummy batteries attracted a great many Allied air attacks and helped the real guns to survive. The Americans were making extensive use of rubber, blown-up tanks and other heavy vehicles as part of Operation Fortitude, but the Germans did not develop such devices. Instead, Rommel poured more concrete and planted more asparagus. Colonel General Georg von Sodenstern, commander of the 19th Army in southern France, thought Rommel mad. He commented on Rommel's fixed defences. As no man in his senses would put his head on an anvil over which the smith's hammer is swung, so no general should mass his troops at the point where the enemy is certain to bring the first powerful blow of his superior material. To which Rommel replied, our friends from the East cannot imagine what they're in for here. It's not a matter of fanatical hordes to be driven forward in masses against our line, with no regard for casualties and little recourse to tactical craft. Here we are facing an enemy who applies all his native intelligence to the use of his many technical resources, who spares no expenditure of material, and whose every operation goes its course as though it had been the subject of repeated rehearsal. He was right in his analysis of the American army, but in the view of General Baron Leo Geyer von Schweppenberg, badly wrong in his conclusion about how to meet the attack. Schweppenberg commanded Panzer Group West. When Rommel began moving the 2nd Panzer Division closer to the coast, north of Amiens, Schweppenberg protested. Rommel insisted and put the leading battle group right on the coast, dug in. He growled to Admiral Rouge, the Panzer Divisions are going to be moved forward, whether they like it or not. Shortly thereafter, an angry General Schweppenberg, accompanied by Hitler's panzer expert, General Heinz Guderian, confronted Rommel. The latter blandly told them he intended to dig in every tank on the coastline. Guderian was shocked. He insisted that the very strength of panzer formations lies in their firepower and mobility. He advised Rommel to pull the tanks back out of range of Allied naval guns. He insisted that the lesson from the Sicily and Salerno landings was crystal clear, the Germans could not fight a decisive battle while they were under those naval guns. Guderian knew that an amphibious force is not at its most vulnerable when it is half ashore, half at sea. It is at its most powerful at that time, thanks to those big naval guns. 
He urged Rommel to think in terms of a counter-offensive launched on the Wehrmacht's terms, at some choke point inland when the enemy was overstretched. That was the way the Russians did it, with great success, as Guderian could testify. Rommel would not budge. If you leave the panzer divisions in the rear, he warned, they will never get forward. Once the invasion begins, enemy air power will stop everything from moving. When Guderian reported to Hitler, he recommended pulling back and fighting inland, which specifically meant keeping command and control of the panzer divisions out of Rommel's hands. Hitler tried a weak-kneed, half-hearted compromise. On May 7th, he turned over three panzer divisions to Rommel, the 2nd, 21st, and 116th. The other four panzer divisions were to be held inland. General Alfred Jodl, chief of OKW, assured Rommel that although the four divisions were under OKW's control, they will be released for operations without further application by yourself, the moment we can be certain about the enemy's intentions and focus of attack. That sounded reasonable, but skipped over this fact. The leadership principle had led to a situation in which a German panzer division commander would in a crisis look to not one man but three for his orders, Rommel, Rundstedt, Hitler. Jodl's sensible-sounding words also ignored the failure to choose between competing strategies. Hitler backed neither Rommel nor the schweppenberg guderian team. Just as he could not trust people, neither could he trust one plan over another. He split his resources and invited defeat in detail. Rommel got his three panzer divisions up as close as he could, especially the 21st, which went into camp around Kayon. The 21st had been Rommel's favourite in Africa, where it had been decimated. It had been rebuilt around a cadre of former officers, including Colonel Hans von Luck. Its commander was General Edgar Feuchtinger, whose qualifications for the job were that he had organised the military displays at the annual party rallies. He had no combat experience, knew nothing of tanks. According to Luck, Feuchtinger was a live and let live person. He was fond of all the good things of life, for which Paris was a natural attraction. He was wise enough to leave the reality of command in the hands of his immediate subordinates. Rommel put the other two panzer divisions under his command, the 12th SS and Panzer Lair, equally distant from Calais and Calvados. They were not close enough to get to the beaches in a few hours, however, a reflection of the immense front line the Germans had to cover. General Fritz Bayerlein, commanding Panzer Lehr, described the division as the best equipped panzer division that Germany ever had. It was 100% armoured, even the infantry was completely armoured. When he took the command, Guderian told him, with this division alone, you must throw the Allies into the sea. Your objective is the coast. No, not the coast, it is the sea. Aside from the three panzer divisions, Rommel's forces had little mobility. Rundstedt, true to his analysis that fighting a mobile battle inland was preferable to fighting a pitched battle from fixed fortifications, put most of his effort in the first five months of 1944 into improving transport facilities for the coastal divisions. But Rundstedt's efforts to put wheels under his army were offset by Rommel's insistence on digging in every available soldier and gun along the coast. Anyway, as Gordon Harrison observes, German notions of mobility in the West in 1944 hardly corresponded to American concepts of a motorised army. German mobile units had at best one or two trucks to move essential supplies, with horse-drawn artillery and general transport. The men were listed as mobile because they had each got a bicycle. The Wehrmacht of 1944 was a strange army. In the Panzer divisions, it had highly mobile forces with superior firepower, absolutely up to date but it did not have the fuel to sustain operations. Thanks to the Allied bombing campaign against the Romanian oil fields, Germany had desperate fuel shortages. In France, that meant the panzer divisions had to sharply curtail their training. In the infantry divisions, meanwhile, the Wehrmacht of 1944 was almost a replica of the Kaiser's army of 1918. It was dependent on rail and horse for its supplies, on foot power for movement, in organisation, tactics and doctrine, it was prepared to fight a 1918 battle, just as the Atlantic Wall was an attempt to build a replica of the World War I trench system. Despite the handicap of inadequate equipment, the German infantry divisions could have been made more mobile through training manoeuvres. But so great was Rommel's obsession with pouring concrete and sticking logs into the tidal flats 
that he put his fighting men to work building beach obstacles. Challenged by a subordinate who wished to emphasize training, Rommel ordered, I hereby forbid all training and demand that every minute be used for work on the beach obstacles. It is on the beaches that the fate of the invasion will be decided, and what is more, during the first 24 hours. Even 21st Panzer units around Khan were put to work putting in asparagus. In March, after the spring thaw had immobilized the armies on the Eastern Front, Hitler began transferring units to the West. Rommel put them into the line where they were most needed. The Kotentan got a new division, the 91st, supposedly mobile, and the 6th Parachute Regiment, commanded by Colonel Frederick von der Heiter, a legend for his exploits in Crete. His regiment was an elite, all-volunteer unit. Average age was 17 and a half, in the 709th Infantry Division on the Kotentan, average age was 36. When he arrived in Normandy, the colonel was shocked by the mediocrity of the armament and equipment of the German divisions. There were weapons from every land that had fallen into German hands over the past 30 years. His own regiment had four kinds of grenade launchers and seven types of light machine guns. Heiter was also shocked when he was shown a document and told to sign. It came from Hitler. He wanted each commander to give his written promise to remain in place, to hold every inch of ground when the invasion came. Heiter refused to sign. His corps commander simply shrugged. Throughout the Cotentin by May, Rommel had three divisions, the 243rd, the 709th, and the 91st. Along the Calvados coast, he had the 352nd facing Omaha, the 716th at the British beaches, with 21st Panzer around Caen. This was neither fish nor fowl. The whole point to pouring all that concrete and digging all those trenches along the coast was to check the enemy long enough to allow a concentrated panzer counterattack before the end of D-Day. But with only one division to cover the whole calvados cotentin coastline, and only two to cover the area from Le Havre to Holland, Rommel could not possibly hope to make an early concentrated panzer attack. By denying Rommel command of the tanks, Hitler denied Rommel his strategy. At that point, a less stubborn general might have taken steps to begin implementing the strategy he didn't believe in, but had been forced by circumstances to adopt. Not Rommel. He stuck to a strategy that by his own logic, given available resources, couldn't work. On the day the battle would be joined, therefore, the mighty Wehrmacht's armoured divisions would be immobilised not so much by the Allied air forces, or by the Allied navies, or by the resistance, as by the leadership principle of the Third Reich. But suppose that Rommel had persuaded Hitler to put the armoured divisions under his immediate command. Suppose further that he got lucky and stationed one panzer division in Bayeux, another at Carentan, as according to General Bayerlein, commander of the Panzer Lehr division, he wanted to do. Then suppose that on D-Day, Rommel launched a panzer-led counterattack against the 4th Infantry at Utah and another at Omaha's left flank and Gold's right. That surely would have created a crisis and caused some chaos on the landing beaches, as well as many casualties. But consider the price to the Wehrmacht. With the Allied communications network, including fire control parties on shore and in the air in radio contact with the Navy gunners, the US and Royal Navies, supported by Canadian, Norwegian, Polish and French warships, would have killed every tank in the assault. In other words, Rommel's most basic idea, to stop the invaders cold on the beach, was flawed. Bringing the panzers down in range of the Allied navies was madness, as Guderian had argued. At Sicily and again at Salerno, German tanks managed to penetrate the Allied lines and get down close to the beach. There they were blasted Allied destroyers firing point-blank. But Rommel had not been at Sicily or Salerno. Rundstedt was right. The Germans' best hope was to fall back from the coast, as the Japanese were learning to do in the Pacific Islands, and fight the battle out of range of an overwhelming naval barrage. That would have required depth to the defence, a series of strong points, as in World War I, to fall back on. Had the same amount of labour gone into building defensive positions at every choke point, river crossing and so forth, as went into building the Atlantic Wall, then the Germans might have held on in France until winter weather closed down operations in 1944. Such a delay would not have won the war for Germany, however, because in the spring of 1945, the Allies would have been able to launch a tremendous air and land bombardment on German lines, 
culminating in August in an atomic bomb over Berlin. But that would take time, and meanwhile Germany's only hope would have come into play. A long winter along the Seine or Somme would have had a terribly depressing effect on Allied morale, given a boost to the German. A long winter along the Seine would have caused Stalin to wonder whether he might not be better off reaching a compromise peace. A long winter would give the Germans time to bring in their secret weapons, most notably the ME-262. Rommel's decision to put as much of his strength on the beaches as possible, behind the strongest fortifications possible, was based on his military judgment. Hitler's decision to approve, partly Rommel's concept of the Atlantic Wall, was based on his political megalomania. His conqueror's mentality forbade him giving up any territory without a fight. Rommel and Hitler made fundamental errors in planning for D-Day, based on faulty judgments. The old man, Field Marshal Rundstedt, who was there for window dressing, was the one who got it right, get out from under those naval guns. But Rommel and Hitler were land fighters. They were more afraid of airplanes than they were of ships. They looked overhead instead of out to sea for danger. They made a mistake. Dr. Detlef Vogel of the Militargeschichtliches Forschungsamt in Freiburg comments, it is truly amazing that the senior army commanders, who had once conducted such nimble operations, suddenly wanted to hide behind a rampart. Equally amazing was the way that Rommel, who had made his reputation as a commander who used brilliant tactics, long-range movements and lightning strikes, had so completely adopted a defensive posture. On May 11th, he visited La Madeleine on Utah Beach. The company commander at the fortification was Lieutenant Arthur Yanka, a 23-year-old who had been badly wounded on the Eastern Front. Rommel arrived in his hawk, with accordions stuffed into the trunk. Rommel's habit was to give an accordion to units that were performing to his satisfaction. Lieutenant Yanka and his men did not get an accordion. Rommel was in a bad mood, which got worse as he strode along the dunes, followed by his staff and the hapless Yanka. His criticism fell like hail. Not enough obstacles on the beach, not enough mines around the blockhouse, not enough barbed wire. Yanka had enough. He protested, Marshal, sir, I string all the wire I'm sent, but I can't do more than that. Your hands, Lieutenant. I want to see your hands, Rommel ordered. Bewildered, Yanka removed his gloves. At the sight of the deep scratches that disfigured his palms, Rommel softened. Very well, Lieutenant, he said. The blood you lost building the fortifications is as precious as what you shed in combat. As he got back into his hawk, Rommel counselled Yanka to keep an eye on each high tide. They surely will come at high tide. The Allies, meanwhile, went ahead with plans that they were sure would work. To them, the Atlantic Wall was formidable, but by no means impregnable. On April 7th, Good Friday, 21st Army Group had completed the overall outline plan and was ready to present it to the division, corps and army commanders. Montgomery presided over a meeting at his headquarters, St. Paul's School, of which Montgomery was a graduate. This exercise, he began, is being held for the purpose of putting all general officers of the field armies in possession of the whole outline plan for Overlord, so as to ensure mutual understanding and confidence. He then laid out the plan, working from left to right, it called for the British 6th Airborne Division to begin its assault right after midnight, with the objectives of knocking out an enemy battery at Merville, seizing intact the bridges over the Orne River and the Orne Canal, blowing the bridges over the dives, and generally acting as flank protection. The British 3rd Division, with French and British commandos attached, was to push across Sword Beach, then pass through Wistrom to capture Caen and Carpiquet Airfield. The Canadian 3rd Division was to push across Juneau Beach and continue on until it cut the Cambayeu Highway. The British 50th Division at Gold had a similar objective, plus taking the small port of Aramanches and the battery at Longs-sur-Mer from the rear. At Omaha, the US 1st and 29th Divisions were to move up the exits, take the villages of Colville, Saint-Laurent and Vieville, then push inland. Attached Ranger Battalions were to capture the battery at Pointe du Hoc either by land or sea or both. At Utah, the 4th Infantry was to cross the beach, establish control of the coast road, and move west along the causeways to the high ground inland, ready to wheel to the right to drive for Cherbourg. The 101st Airborne would land southwest of saint mary glise to secure the inland side of the causeways, 
and to destroy the bridges in the vicinity of Carentan, while seizing others to protect the southern flank at Utah. The 82D Airborne was to land west of Saint-Sauveur-le-Vicomte to block the movement of enemy reinforcements into the Cotentin in the western half of the peninsula. At the briefing, Montgomery acted on the assumption that getting ashore was not the problem. What worried him was staying ashore. He told his subordinates, Rommel is likely to hold his mobile divisions back from the coast until he is certain where our main effort is being made. He will then concentrate them quickly and strike a hard blow. His static divisions will endeavour to hold on defensively to important ground and act as pivots to the counterattacks. By dusk on D-1, the enemy will be certain that the Neptune area, code name for the seaborne portion of Overlord, is to be assaulted in strength. By the evening of D-Day, he will know the width of frontage and the approximate number of our assaulting divisions. Montgomery thought that Rommel would bring two panzer divisions against the lodgment on D plus one. By D plus five, it would be six panzer divisions. Protecting and expanding the lodgment area would be more difficult than establishing it. With their objectives set, the generals and colonels went to work at division, regimental and battalion levels to develop specific plans for getting ashore. As they and their staffs worked through April and into May, Rommel was building, pouring concrete, setting posts. They could not be so confident as Montgomery that getting ashore was the least of their problems. For them, it was the first of their problems, the one that had to be overcome, or there would be no more problems. The plan that emerged ran as follows. The first regiments to hit the shore would come in on the heels of a pre-assault air and naval bombardment. It was designed to neutralise known gun positions and demoralise enemy troops. It would begin at midnight, with an RAF attack against coastal batteries from the mouth of the Seine to Cherbourg, 1,333 heavy bombers dropping 5,316 tonnes of bombs. At first light, the US 8th Air Force would hit enemy beach defences in the assault area. Strong points at Omaha were due to get hit by 480 B-24S carrying 1,285 tonnes of bombs. Troops scheduled to go ashore at Omaha were assured that there would be innumerable craters on the beaches, more than enough to provide protection and shelter. Naval gunfire would commence at sunrise and continue to H minus five minutes. Sunrise was at 0558, H hour set for 0630. At Omaha, the battleships Texas and Arkansas would fire their 10 14-inch and 12 12-inch guns, respectively, from 18 kilometres offshore, concentrating on Pointe du Hoc and enemy strongpoints defending the exits. They would be joined by three cruisers with 6-inch guns and eight destroyers with 5-inch guns. If that bombardment failed to render the defenders dead, incapacitated or immobilised by fright, smaller fire support craft would precede the first wave to add to the Germans' misery. At Omaha, 16 LCTs carrying four DD tanks each were fitted so that two tanks could fire up to 150 rounds per cannon over the ramp, beginning from a range of three kilometres at about H minus 15 minutes. Ten LCTs would carry 36 105mm howitzers, self-propelled, of the 58th and 62nd Armoured Field Artillery Battalions. The howitzers were mounted so that they could fire 100 rounds per gun from the LCTs at a range of 8 kilometres, commencing at H minus 30 minutes. Finally, 14 LCTRs were outfitted as rocket launchers. Each LCTR fired 1,000 high-explosive rockets simultaneously from 3 kilometres offshore. Under that cover, the first waves would land. The plans for the assault landings varied from regiment to regiment, beach to beach, that of the 116th Infantry of the 29th Division on the western, right flank at Omaha, was representative. As the accompanying chart shows, the 116th's plan to penetrate the defences was complex and detailed down to the seconds. At H-5 minutes, just as the naval and air bombardments lifted, and as the rockets from the LCTRs whistled overhead, companies B and C of the 743rd Tank Battalion, 32 tanks strong, would touch down on the right. These were DD tanks, which would swim ashore from 6,000 yards out. They would take up firing positions at the water's edge to cover the first wave of infantry. At H hour, 0630, eight LCTs would land to the left, bringing ashore with them Company A of the 743rd Tank Battalion. With Company A, there would be eight tank dozers, 
towing trailers of explosive to be used by combat engineers in demolishing the obstacles before the tide covered them. At H plus one minute, the first wave of infantry would touch down. Company A on the far right at Dog Green, Companies E, F and G at Easy Green, Dog Red and Dog White. Each company was about 200 men strong. Firepower included rifles, machine guns, Bangalore torpedoes, bazookas, mortars and grenades. Behind these skirmishers would come engineers, followed by light artillery and anti-aircraft batteries, more engineers, then at H plus 50 minutes another wave of infantry, the 116th's L, I, K and C companies. At H plus 60 minutes two ranger battalions would come in on the right. At H plus 110 minutes, Duke KWs would bring in heavy artillery. At H plus three hours, Navy salvage units and truck companies would move in. By then, the beach should be clear, the fighting rifle companies moving inland. Brig General Norman Dutch Cota, second in command of the 29th Division, did not like the idea of storming ashore an hour after first light. He had little faith in the accuracy of air and naval bombardment, thought it would do little good, and wanted to land the first wave in total darkness. That way the assault troops could cross the tidal flat safely and would be able to take up firing and attacking positions at the foot of the bluff before the Germans could see them. The beach is going to be fouled up in any case, he declared. Darkness will not substantially alter the percentage of accuracy in beaching, not enough to offset the handicaps of a daylight assault. He was overruled. Each movement required an exact timing schedule that would begin three and four days before H hour at ports in southwestern England that were up to 160 kilometres from Omaha. Men and equipment would load up on LSTs, LCIs and LCTs. Off the mouths of the harbours the convoys would form up. After crossing the channel, the ships would anchor off the coast of France. Men would climb down the rope nets to their LCVPs or descend in the boats as they were lowered by the davits. They would circle, circle, circle until they got clearance to form up line abreast and go in. There was much more to the plan of assault than outlined here, and there were variations at different sectors and beaches, but basically the 116th plan was similar to those elsewhere. The emphasis was on a crescendo of high explosives hitting the beach defences for a half hour before the tanks arrived, to be immediately followed by the first wave of skirmishers, who should be able to take advantage of the dazed enemy and seize the trenches as well as the exits from the beach. After that, it was a question of getting enough transport and firepower ashore quickly enough to take the plateau area and move inland. All this was planned out on a timetable that was exceedingly rigid and complicated, and it was done without a single computer. When PVT John Barnes of Company A, 116th Infantry, attended the briefing on the assault plan, he was mighty impressed. He would be going ashore at H hour. One minute later, E Company would come in behind him, followed by engineers at H hour plus three minutes. Then would come Headquarters Company and anti-aircraft artillery, then more engineers, then Company L at H hour plus 50 minutes, and so on through the day. It seemed so organized, Barnes recalled, that nothing could go wrong, nothing could stop it. It was like a train schedule. We were almost just like passengers. We were aware that there were many landing boats behind us, all lined up coming in on schedule. Nothing could stop it. Others were not so sure. Captain Robert Miller of the 175th Regiment, 29th Division, remembered his CO, Colonel Paul Pop Good, holding up the operation plan for the regiment. It was thicker than the biggest telephone book you've ever seen. After the briefing was completed, Colonel Good stood up. He picked it up and tried to tear it in half, but it was so thick that this strong man couldn't do it. So he simply threw it over his shoulder and said, forget this goddamned thing. You get your ass on the beach. I'll be there waiting for you and I'll tell you what to do. There ain't anything in this plan that is going to go right. Had Eisenhower heard the remarks, he would have agreed. Whenever he said that before the battle plans are everything, he added that as soon as the battle was joined, plans were worthless. By mid-May, the plans down to regimental level were complete, but not poured in cement. Changes were made right up to D-Day in response to new information, or the pace of Rommel's construction activities. At Omaha, for example, Major Kenneth Lord, Assistant G-3, Operations for the 1st Division, spotted an ominous development. Up to mid-April, 
First Division staff had noted happily that the hedgehogs and Belgian gate obstacles were piled up on the beaches, rather than being put in place. But when a B-17 happened to jettison some bombs onto Omaha Beach before returning to England from an aborted raid, Lord examined a photograph of the bombs exploding. He saw a series of sympathetic detonations of underwater mines just at Easy Red Beach. Major Lord appealed to the Navy to take care of the mines, pointing out that the official landing operations manual gave the Navy responsibility up to the high tide mark. The Navy did not disagree. It just said it did not have an ability to demolish those mines. First Division appealed to Shayef and got two engineering battalions assigned to it. The Division HQ put them into the first wave. When Lord informed the engineers that they would lead the way, they expressed great shock. Lord assured them that they would have plenty of support from the DD tanks. He pointed out that the DDs had worked beautifully during practice exercises. Those exploding mines caused consternation at 21st Army Group. Were they electric, or pressure, or magnetic, or what? To find out, they sent Captain George Lane, a commando working with cops, to bring back a sample. One night in late April he swam among the obstacles. He could find only teller mines. He brought one back. His superiors nearly died of fright when I presented it because it was not waterproofed. It was never meant to be an underwater mine. So they realised that the corrosion must have played havoc with its mechanism, and it might go off any minute. They told Lane there must be something else, and sent him back, not only to look for new types of mines, but to take infrared photographs of the underwater obstacles. In May, they sent him back once again, and his luck ran out. He was captured by a German e-boat, and brought to Rommel's headquarters at La roche guillon An elegant staff officer came into the room and asked, well, how are things in England? The weather must be beautiful. End of May is always nice in England. It turned out he had an English wife. He took Lane in to see Rommel. You are in a very serious situation, Rommel said, because we think you're a saboteur. Lane turned to the interpreter. Please tell His Excellency that I know that if he thought I was a saboteur, he wouldn't have invited me here. Rommel laughed. So you regard this as an invitation? Yes, indeed, Lane answered, and I consider this a great honour indeed, and I'm delighted about it. Rommel laughed again, then asked, So how's my friend Montgomery? Lane said he did not know Montgomery. Well, what do you think he's doing? I only know what I read in the Times. It says he is preparing the invasion. Do you really think there's going to be an invasion? The British will invade? That's what I read in the Times, so I believe it. Well, if they are, this is going to be the first time that the British Army will do some fighting. What can you mean? Lane demanded. They always get other people to do the fighting for them. The Australians, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, the South Africans. They are very clever people, these English. Rommel grew serious. Well, where do you think the invasion is coming? I certainly don't know. They don't tell junior officers. But if it was up to me, I would do it across the shortest possible way. Yes, Rommel nodded. That's very interesting. They talked politics. Rommel thought the British should be fighting side by side with the Germans against the Russians. Lane thought not. When Lane was dismissed, he was driven to Paris and turned over to the Gestapo. But the Gestapo asked no questions, used no torture. After all, he had been interrogated by Rommel himself. So Lane was very lucky, as were the Allies. Lane's missions had all been directed against the Calvados coast of France. Other adjustments had to be made. In the Cotentin, the arrival in late May of the German 91st Division in the area where the 82nd Airborne was scheduled to come down, caused a change in plan. On May 28th, the drop zone was moved west, astride the Murderay, with the objective of seizing the ground between the Murderay and Douve rivers. Daily I viewed new aerial photographs of Utah, Colonel James Van Fleet, commander of the 8th Regiment, 4th Division, recalled. The Germans were working furiously to strengthen their defences. It seemed a terrible assault against steel and cannon for us to make. I kept asking the Navy to land us further south, to get away from these defences. But the Navy commander said the water was too shallow, and our boats would ground. Van Fleet did win one fight with the Navy. The operations manual said the skippers of the LCTs would decide when to launch the DD tanks, Van Fleet had little faith in the DDs. 
He wanted the Navy to take them in as close as possible before launching, because the DDs moved so slowly in water and were terribly vulnerable to artillery. The Navy insisted that the skipper would decide when to launch. Van Fleet recalled, I argued back so strongly that the Navy backed down. The tank commander would give the launch command. Multiply Lords and Van Fleet's experiences by hundreds to get some idea of the scope of the ever-changing planning operation. With such dedication, and with such an awesome firepower, how could the invasion not work? Montgomery had no doubts. On May 15th, he held the final great dress rehearsal for Overlord at his St. Paul's school headquarters. Churchill was there, and King George VI and all the brass, admirals and generals from the United States, the United Kingdom and Canada. Montgomery presided in a large lecture room. The audience looked down from a crescent-shaped auditorium. On the floor, Montgomery had placed a huge coloured map of Lower Normandy. Churchill arrived smoking a cigar. When the king arrived, Churchill bowed in his usual jerky fashion, retaining the cigar in one hand. As we took our seats, ADM Morton Deo of the US Navy, in command of the bombardment group for Utah, later wrote, the room was hushed and the tension palpable. It seemed to most of us that the proper meshing of so many gears would need nothing less than divine guidance. A failure at one point could throw the momentum out of balance and result in chaos. All in that room were aware of the gravity of the elements to be dealt with. Eisenhower spoke first. He was brief. I would emphasize but one thing, he said. I consider it to be the duty of anyone who sees a flaw in the plan not to hesitate to say so. According to Deo, his smile was worth twenty divisions. Before the warmth of his quiet confidence, the mists of doubt dissolved. Montgomery took over. He was wearing a well-cut battle dress with knife-like trouser creases. He looked trim and spoke in a tone of quiet emphasis. According to the note-taker, Churchill occasionally interrupted him to ask questions designed to show off his military knowledge. At one point the PM intervened, saying a trifle wryly that at Anzio we had put ashore 160,000 men and 25,000 vehicles and had advanced only 12 miles. He thought, therefore, that to take a risk occasionally would certainly do no harm. Montgomery remained quiet and deliberate. Montgomery's message was, We have a sufficiency of troops. We have all the necessary tackle. We have an excellent plan. This is a perfectly normal operation which is certain of success. If anyone has any doubts in his mind, let him stay behind. He was more realistic about Rommel's plans than he had been in April, when he had expected the enemy to hold back his tanks for the first couple of days. Now, he said, Rommel is an energetic and determined commander. He has made a world of difference since he took over. He is best at the spoiling attack. His forte is disruption. He is too impulsive for the set-piece battle. He will do his level best to Dunkirk us, by using his own tanks well forward. Montgomery said, We have the initiative. We must rely on a. the violence of our assault b. Our great weight of supporting fire from the sea and the air. c. Simplicity. d. Robust mentality. He went on to say some words that later would come back to haunt him. We must blast our way ashore and get a good lodgment before the enemy can bring sufficient reserves up to turn us out. Armoured columns must penetrate deep inland and quickly on D-Day. This will upset the plans and tend to hold him off while we build up strength. We must gain space rapidly and peg out claims well inland. The meeting began at nine hours and concluded at 1415, thus ending, according to the minutes, the greatest assembly of military leadership the world has ever known. Churchill was all pumped up. At the beginning of 1944, he had expressed qualms about Overlord, saying to Eisenhower on one occasion, when I think of the beaches of Normandy choked with the flower of American and British youth, and when in my mind's eye, I see the tides running red with their blood. I have my doubts. I have my doubts. Early in May, Eisenhower had lunched alone with the Prime Minister. When they were parting, Churchill had grown emotional. With tears in his eyes, he had said, I am in this thing with you to the end, and if it fails, we will go down together. But after the St. Paul's briefing, Churchill grabbed Eisenhower by the arm and said, I am hardening toward this enterprise. That was a bit late to be getting on the team, but it was good that he had finally joined up. As for Eisenhower, his confidence was high. 